Uh, that is a question uh, which, uh, in our opinion here at CHR, uh, is a basically incorrect question. Um, because we have a very hard time finding a rationale uh, in doing PGD to improve IVF outcomes. Uh, PGD uh, has been once before very aggressively promoted uh, to improve pregnancy outcomes uh, in association with IVF approximately five, six, seven years ago. Uh, this was done, the, the commercial term was not PGD pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, but PGS pre-implantation genetic screening. Uh, and uh, PGS in those days was very widely propagated. Thousands of women worldwide uh, were told that it would improve their IVF pregnancy chances. And then, uh, after it had been used uh, for a good number of years on a very wide scale, uh, it was finally recognized uh, that PGS not only did not improve uh, pregnancy chances in association with IVF, but in selected patient population, particularly in older women and in women with diminished ovarian reserve, actually reduces pregnancy chances. Once that was finally recognized, uh, the utilization of PGS uh, plummeted, though surprisingly uh, was not completely stopped. Uh, there are still some programs, or there have been programs over the last few years, who still continued utilizing it for reasons which uh, I frankly do not understand. Indeed, we here at CHR were probably amongst the earliest voices six, seven years ago, uh, trying to convince our colleagues in publications that PGS uh, very unlikely would give the positive IVF outcome results everybody was expecting. And we came to the conclusion by analyzing some published data from European colleagues. Uh, by reanalyzing those data, we actually also concluded that especially older women um, and women with diminished ovarian res uh, reserve were actually at risk uh, for a worse outcome if they used PGS. Uh, you know, we at some point published that in a paper, and uh, but the big, uh, the big change uh, or the the widely accepted recognition of that opinion came after some. Uh, Dutch colleagues uh, published a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine where they prospectively randomized patients to PGS uh, and no PGS and showed exactly what we had predicted, namely that the older women that they studied actually ended up worse off than, than others. Uh, the utilization of PGS then greatly declined, though never stopped, and then over the last year or two, we are seeing a resurgence. And uh, this resurgence, in our opinion here at CHR, is very unfortunate because it seems to be, re uh, to be repeating the same mistakes that were made during the initial first introduction of PGS. The reason why the same mistakes are being made all over and while the same, in our opinion, misrepresentations are being made all over again to patients, inducing them to, to go through PGS and pay for PGS, is that our colleagues believe that newer techniques to accurately diagnose chromosomal abnormalities will make the difference. Uh, and we don't. Uh, there is no question that over the last four or five years, the technique to diagnose an embryo accurately has improved. But we never believed that 
the inaccuracies in diagnosing a given embryo, whether it ha is chromosomally normal or chromosomally abnormal, was the reason why PGS didn't work in the first place. We always thought that that contributed a little bit to it. Obviously, one wants to be as accurate as possible in diagnostic methodology. But we always felt that mathematically, the concept didn't work, especially for older women and women who have very few embryos, like women with premature ovarian, uh, prematurely diminished ovarian reserve, uh, because women who have very few embryos have to value each embryo very highly. In contrast, if a woman has lots of embryos, if one embryo gets a little damaged or loses pregnancy chance, it's not a big deal because she has so many embryos. And therefore, we always argued that if there were patients where PGS may make sense and may work out as a mathematical model, uh, meaning where selection of normal embryos would make sense, was in young women who had lots of embryos. And that was always counterintuitive to what the specialty, what the field believed, because chromosomal abnormalities increase with advancing female age. And so, uh, intuitively, our colleagues always believed that the patients who would most benefit from the procedure are older women or women with premature ovarian aging because they have so many, such a high degree of chromosomal abnormalities. But they also have the fewest numbers of embryos. And when you calculate this mathematically through, and uh, when you accept the logic and obvious fact that manipulating an embryo more, doing a biopsy for diagnostic purposes, will to a minor degree reduce pregnancy chances. And when you add all of this up, uh, the, the mathematical modeling shows you that you can expect overall outcome benefits only at best in patients who have large embryo numbers, and that's not the older patient in whom most of those procedures have been recommended. Now, uh, our colleagues who are now bringing back PGS are ignoring this whole thing, and they think that simply by having more accurate diagnosis of embryos, they are ahead of the old PGS, and that will make the difference. There's already data in the literature and we have recently published a few papers on that um, that show that our point of view is correct. And so uh, we feel very, very strongly um, that PGS uh, not only is a waste of time, money, and effort for the overwhelming majority of women going through IVF, but it actually, in many women, unfortunately will reduce their chance of conception. And so we caution from the use of, of PGS, even the new PGS, uh, whatever is being represented. As we sit here, uh, I think nobody can tell with certainty whether the whole idea of PGS really works. The idea of PGS is a very attractive idea because we know that a lot of embryos that humans produce, even young women, are chromosomally abnormal. And, and therefore, the, the basic concept to select out chromosomally normal embryos before transferring embryo back into the uterus sounds wonderful. Except that theory always uh, does not always transfer into good clinical practice. And that's why we need clinical trials because otherwise we could just be very smart, think, have great ideas, and would solve all the problems in the world. That's not how medicine works. PGS, in its first incarnation, and now in its second incarnation, uh, in our opinion, has failed to improve pregnancy chances. Uh, and it has failed to improve pregnancy chances because it is used, we believe, in the wrong patient population. Uh, we have some experimental data, uh, which we published last year, from patients who 
went through PGS not in order to improve their pregnancy chances, but for other reasons, for example, sex selection. So they did not have routine infertility, and they were not the youngest, but also not as old as our uh, infertility patients. And in those patients, when we did a case control study, which is not the perfect way to do a study, but a quite well controlled way of doing a study, we indeed found some outcome benefits from doing PGS. But that is not your average infertility patient. And those data, as I said, are preliminary. So we believe that there is a patient population probably out there that may benefit from doing PGS in their IVF cycles. But it definitely is not the patient population in whom PGS is now recommended. Uh, in our opinion, it is probably a young patient population. And whether they want to do it and spend the additional money for it is, of course, questionable. So um, that's as far as we can go today. Um, otherwise, uh, we have still to do a lot of studies to really define the right patient population for PGS.